how do you take control of your finances? The one thing that holds people back is some people will read and read and listen and study and they will never do anything. Am I waiting for someone to dictate to me what my salary is going to be or what I'm going to get a bonus or what I'm going to get a pay increase? Or am I going to start to do other things to make sure that I have control over income that I'm bringing in? Hi, and welcome to the Micro Empires podcast, where we learn how to build small empires for wealth and security, because you don't have to be wealthy to build wealth. I'm Jennifer Grimson. I'm your host. Let's get started. I am so excited to have with us Leslie Batson. Her website is Rebel Rock Wealth, and I met Leslie at Podcast Movement this summer, and we only got chat for just a few minutes but we really connected and then we were able to talk by phone. And I was so impressed by, she has a a full-time career. She's got side hustles. She has been a survivor. And one of the things that she has put in place to build her own security is something that's called securing notes, which uh, there aren't a lot of people who know what that is, but she launched her website, which is Rebel Rock Wealth which is a unique wealth strategy practice that teach people the whole truth about money uh, outside of the stock market. And she serves clients across the U.S. Like me, she's not a financial advisor, but a person who has learned through experiences how to grow her own money. And what she became really passionate about, something I'd never heard of before, and it's taken me 10 times to get it right, is something called <laughs> infinite banking, which is a tool that has been reserved and only used by the wealthy. And her passion, I really connected with you over this, was, you know, I think we call it passion, but really, when you find out about these things, it makes me angry that we haven't had access to this stuff as as average folks. So that Mm -hmm. is how I met Mm -hmm. Leslie, and I'm excited to bring her to you today. So welcome, and thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. So one of the things I wanted to start out with, if you could just tell a little bit about the background. As I look through your profile and your website, you mentioned there are a series of life events that led you to this place. If you'd share with us a little bit about what that was and what drove you to begin this business. Sure. Well, so I would say like a lot of people, when life happens, (laughs) when some kind of major life event happens, that's when they start to take a look at their finances. In my situation, I was going through a divorce. And for anyone who's ever been through a divorce or, you know, a major separation, if you've been with someone for a long time, you know, you've been living a lifestyle with the combined income, and now you're going to be moving forward with just yours. And for me, it was a little bit, uh, you know, it was just really a wake up call. And I decided I need to just take my finances more seriously. And so I got online, I started researching and, you know, just reading and getting information. And I thought, okay, like some of this makes sense. Some of it doesn't really make sense to me. Let me go talk to a professional. <laughs> so then I went and made, I found who I thought would be a great financial advisor. Um, I met with them, cost me $2,000. <laughs> and, you know, they gave me a beautiful um, package at the end. But in the end, they really didn't tell me more than what I was finding online. And I, I just thought, well, this isn't really going to work. So what always seems to happen is I'm going to have to you know, figure out the solution for myself. <laughs> so I just started digging in. You know, really, I just wanted to understand how do the wealthy people get wealthy and how do they keep their wealth, more importantly? Because, you know, sometimes it can be easy to just, you know, bring in income and bring in money, but it's really about how much you keep that matters. So I started doing a little bit of real estate investing. And I think you touched on the notes and we can talk about that more if you like. But I started doing a little bit of real estate investing. I started listening to different podcasts and just, you know, just trying to get into different circles and just, you know, have these discussions. And in the end, what totally caught my attention was something called infinite banking. And what that is, is using whole life insurance policies. These are high cash value whole life policies that are set up a specific way that allow you to store cash into these policies. So that's the first step. It's really a tool to, you know, build up your savings. And then once you start to build up that cash value, using it for investments, 
or just financing things that you normally finance in life, whether that's your cars, whether it's your, you know, college educations, whether it's, you know, weddings, home improvements, maybe if you're a business owner, it's, you know, really helping you cover your business taxes, buying inventory, getting new equipment. I mean, there's so many different, you know, reasons why people use this strategy, but what it basically does is allow you to finance what you need for yourself without the dependency on the banks. There's no application form to fill out when you want to, you know, access your money. They don't care about your credit score. (laughs) They don't care how long you want to use the money. Basically it's your money that you're borrowing against. So Mm -hmm. you are putting money into a whole life policy and it's essentially, it's kind of like building equity. So if you think of it like a home, you build up equity in your home and then some people might take a home equity line of credit. Mm-hmm. So it's a very similar thing. It's not like you're, you know, taking pieces of your home and paying, you know, brick by brick. You just have a credit line against the equity of your home and you're using that for different things. And this is a similar concept. So there's many benefits to using a whole life policy, but that's just in a nutshell, one of the things that I started to do. So getting policies in place and then starting to leverage the cash value that's in there for investing and just for other expenses. Well, right away, I can (laughs) sense out in the universe, the FI community, the financial independence community exploding (laughs) because the marching orders are never get whole life insurance. I've been told that I have been drinking that Kool-Aid as well. Just today, I had the conversation with my husband where he was like, wait a minute, I thought blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, I don't know. I'm learning today. But I think the key in what you said is a couple things. Number one, it's taboo. And so if you have any like background on that or why it is, I'd love to know. But number two, you talk about specifically setting it up. So I had a whole life at some point. I don't know what it was. I got rid of it. But a question's about how you set that up. Are you limited on your investments like a self-directed IRA? And then what about those of us later in life? You know, if I was 25 and I started this, great. But is this one of these things that I can really start at 50? And am I really going to be able to buy a piece of property with this kind of money? And and is there compounding interest, et cetera? So I know that's a lot. But anyway, I could just hear our FI community going, no. So I guess start there. Okay. So I'll try to remember all those different questions, <laughs> but I'll start with, you know, what we've all heard our whole lives is buy term and invest the rest. Okay. So buy term. So people would basically say, or they encourage you to just buy a term life insurance policy because it's cheap. You would get it for 20, 30 years, whatever it might be that would take you through to age 65 or until you've paid off your home or whatever is the criteria that they use. But they basically say, just get cheap term life insurance that you're covered and use the rest of the money to invest in the stock market or for whatever, in whatever vehicle. So what I try to educate people on about this is that that term, that that phrase buy term and invest the rest was actually a a tagline for a company. (laughs) It's a company that's known today as Primerica, but it's founder back in the seventies. I believe it was either seventies or eighties, but I think it was the, in the seventies. At that time, up until that time, most people would buy annual renewable term life insurance. That's what like most people knew and understood. They understood that each year they're going to pay a little bit more for their life insurance coverage. And so it was, you know, easier to digest. So each year they'd pay a little bit more and they'd have insurance coverage, but it was still a version of a term policy. Now in the seventies, his company, they designed a, an insurance product, which is what we understand as term today, where it said, okay, let's just have them pay a flat amount for whatever term. So it could be a 10 year term, 20 year term, 30 year term, whatever is the term. And they will just pay that flat amount. But then at that point, that's when, you know, the premiums will go back up to, you know, to kind of adjust to the actual cost of insurance at that point. But most people, they won't need it at that point anyway, because you know, they would have been investing their money for those 30 years and now they have enough money and their house is paid off. So they have enough money to, you know, to live off of and pay and leave for their beneficiary. So there's no need for them to have insurance at that point. So they basically just created a type of um, insurance product of what we know today as term life insurance. 
whole life insurance existed. In fact, whole life insurance has existed for decades, really for centuries. <laughs> but in the form that we know it today, just plain old vanilla whole life has been around forever. And it costs more <laughs> because if you think of it as a term, the term is your whole life, right? So it's not just 10 or 20 or 30 years like term life insurance, which is very affordable because those are the years when you're the least likely to die. So it's really kind of like a cash cow for the insurance companies, right? I mean, obviously it's a product that works. If you were to pass away, your beneficiaries would make some money, but the likelihood of you passing away in those years is so low. That's why it's affordable. Mm -hmm. Now, whole life insurance, because it covers your whole life, which means you are inevitably going to die. <laughs> we all are, which means it's going to cover you for that whole period. You may, you know, get the policy at age 30 and you may only live to 50, but you may live to be 100. So it would be covering you for 70 years. So the premiums are going to be higher. But the other difference between term and whole life is that with term insurance, it's kind of like your car insurance, right? It really only takes effect once something happens. But with whole life insurance, you, as I kind of discussed earlier, you have the option to build up what's called a cash value account. So when your policy is structured properly. So you'd use a licensed agent like myself or someone who's familiar with the strategies, they would set up your policy the right way, um, which basically allows you to pay premiums that obviously cover your life insurance, but it also creates some additional space in your policy to put more cash in there. Mm -hmm. So people use it as kind of like a savings vehicle, especially with, you know, savings rates today. If your bank account is probably getting 1% or <laughs> something like right. that in your savings account, you know, if the policy is structured properly, you're probably getting somewhere between, you know, mid threes and 5%, it just depends on how it's set up. But you're, you know, at the bare minimum, if you only wanted to use it as a savings account, you would at least have that benefit. But infinite banking is where you're actually leveraging, um, you know, the cash value balance that's in there and using it towards other things. Right, right. I was looking at an asset that you had provided earlier, just kind of comparing savings, like a savings account, a money market, a CD, and a whole yeah. life insurance. And we'll share that in the show notes, just kind of what you're able to do with each of those. I mean, I think everybody knows that a savings account is basically worthless. But I, you know, when you talk about the term life, when I was 30 years old, 29 years old, whatever, going through my divorce, I got a term life at the time, 30 years old, in great physical shape, earning a, a good amount of money. And uh, I was able to get a $1 million term life. Then later, <laughs> when I tried yeah. to get, I mean, my, my term policy now is $150,000 only because I didn't want to pay a huge premium, but you know, I'm, I'm at the, I'm getting into the ages where, you know, I might die or get sick. I was wondering if you could just walk us through, you know, someone like me, I'm 51 years old and you know, we don't have to go into great detail, but what it would mean for me, what it means monthly getting started when I have access to that money, how fast, how much am I limited? Maybe if you've got a generic overview for someone like me. Sure. Sure. And you asked earlier, like, you know, if you're, you know, not in your twenties, does it still make sense? And it absolutely makes sense, right? There's always different reasons why people, you know, go ahead and get a policy. Obviously, you know, you have to qualify. So there is an application process to actually get a policy, right? Your premiums are based on like your health, your age, you know, there's different factors that are considered. So that's why it's cheaper and whether it's term or whole life or anything, it's always cheaper to get insurance when you're younger <laughs> than when you're yeah. older. But yeah, so you would go through the process and you would apply and you decide how much you how I try to help people think of it is not necessarily just think about how much money do I need? Like, do I need a $1 million policy that would cover my assets when I die? I mean, obviously that is important or because if you have children and you want to make sure that they, you know, have resources if you pass away, but it's more thinking like how much money do I put away in savings each year? And those are, that's how we would structure your policy. So for example, there are some people who are maybe every month putting away a few hundred dollars into a 529 to save for their kids' college. Some people are putting, you know, the 19,000 a year into a 401k plan. Some people just from their, you know, basic savings, they're putting, you know, let's just say a thousand dollars a month into their savings. So 
you can look at the different ways that people are already sort of diverting their money and sort of just total what that would be and consider that as what you would put into your whole life policy. Now, these policies can be structured in a way. So let's just say that that totaled, you know, let's just say that totaled $30,000. So it doesn't mean that we would just go ahead and get you a policy where your premiums are $30,000 a year. We would show you what that could look like, but what we would do is set it up where, um, because there might be a year where, you know, maybe things are, you know, not as, as strong. Maybe you can only put in $10,000 in that year. Maybe, the, but maybe there's a year where you can put in 40, you know? So what we would do is kind of just look at your particular situation and figure out, you know, what makes sense for you? What are your objectives? There are people who are in their sixties and what they're doing is based on, so if we look at the, the latest, you know, Trump's new tax policies, um, a lot of people get excited because they're like, Ooh, we got a tax cut. But what that really means is that the country is bringing in less tax revenue. In fact, there was just a report came out just a couple of weeks ago. It showed that we are like literally now a trillion, we have like a trillion dollar deficit. <laughs> so meaning the budget has a trillion dollar deficit, meaning we have a trillion dollars less money than we should actually have to pay our bills. Mm-hmm. And that's not going to get any different. The only thing that's going to change it is if the different costs come down. So whether it's the military or whatever the costs are, the only thing that can change it is reducing costs or increasing the tax revenue. And with 10,000 baby boomers retiring a day, so more social security, more, you know, just more dependencies on the government, it's highly unlikely that the country's costs are going to go down. I think what's going to happen when his policy rates expire in 2026, they're supposed to just go back up to what they were prior to 2018. But I don't think it matters whether you're a Democrat or Republican. <laughs> I don't think we can afford to just go back up to that. I think people are going to be surprised that tax rates are going to end up going higher. Sure. So there are people now in their 60s and even 70s who are starting to convert over money into policy. So they're moving them out of uh, like 401k plans and IRAs and uh, moving them into something like a whole life policy. One of the reasons that they're doing that is because, number one, once you put your money into whole life policy, it's it's quote unquote tax free. And I say quote unquote because if you implement the strategies properly, you would not take out the money that would be taxable. It's kind of like with your Roth, how you're putting in after tax dollars and then it grows tax free. So your whole life policy is similar. So you've already paid taxes on that money. You're putting it in there and it's growing. You're not paying income taxes. You're not paying ongoing fees. If you were to look at your IRA or 401k or any of those plans or brokerage types accounts, they have fees on them. Or if someone has an advisor and they're charging, you know, 1% of assets under management, you know, that 1% makes a huge difference. Yes, it does. And even if you're managing the money yourself and you don't have that 1% fee, you have the ongoing transaction fees every time you, you know, put money into your account, every time you move it to a different fund, every time the company itself, when they produce statements, I mean, there's always these ongoing costs and fees, whether it's administrative fees or transaction fees. So those are ongoing fees that are continuously eroding at your money as well. So two things that whole life insurance kind of protects you from is ongoing fees and those taxes. Right. Is it possible to roll over 401k funds into something like this? Well, you wouldn't roll it over. So you okay. would have to be like taking the withdrawal. So let's say, especially people who are, you know, they've reached say 70 and they have the required 70 and a half and they've hit the required minimum distributions. Like they have to take that money out, but maybe they don't need it at that point. Instead of just using it and spending it or putting it into savings or, you know, putting it into, you know, stock market or something like that, they're putting it into a policy. And then again, mm-hmm. remember over time, so the policy is growing and then they can leverage that money to invest in something else. So whether it's real estate or notes or something like that. And when you talked about that, I, I don't know if there are low fees, interest in transaction fees or none, but I know with other vehicles, for example, a first position HELOC, one of the reasons it's not popular and you don't learn about it is because it has, it's very low fees, it's, it's not interesting to banks. They'll do it, mm-hmm. but they don't make like what they will if you get a mortgage, if you get a 30-year mortgage. Is that the same here? 
Um, well, the thing is with any type of line of credit, credit card, loan, you know, like a loan from a bank and that type of thing, those are ongoing, right? Like basically you're going to continue to pay fees or interest as long as that money is outstanding. Now, let me be clear. If you are to take a loan out from like, so basically if you have money in your cash value account in your whole life policy and you borrow against it, right? So keep in mind, you're not withdrawing the money. You're just borrowing against it. Now, the insurance company is going to charge you an interest rate, right? Um, You're not going to get to borrow it for free. But the difference is that it's simple interest and that interest you pay back at your schedule, right? You decide when you want to pay that back. So I always advise clients to at least just pay the interest back each year. But if you, let's just say, wanted to use that, say that you have that money building up and you decide to pull out, let's say, $50,000 to you know invest in a property, and you're going to hold that property for five years. Now you're going to be getting some, you know, some type of investment income, some maybe monthly cash flows from that investment. What I would encourage them to do is put those monies back in, right? So as you're getting the cash flows from the investment, put them back into the policy so that you're reducing your outstanding loan. But after five years, once you've sold off the property or you got, you know, somehow you've got the money back, you're putting the money right back into the policy. So it doesn't matter. The, the insurance company isn't going to give you any type of schedule to say, okay, you've got to pay this back in 60 months at, you know, whatever, $700 a month or anything like that. They're not going to give you that pay schedule. You determine how much you want to pay and when. And you may not ever pay it back, right? right. And the insurance company is okay with that as well because they are not going to lend you more than what's in your cash value account. And in the event that you were to pass away, if you have an outstanding loan, then that would be reduced or deducted from the amount that gets paid out from your beneficiaries. And when you're paying yourself back, you technically are paying your self-interest because you're paying Correct. back into it. So I, I know that's hard for people to understand. And then are there limits on investments? If I want to pull out $50,000 because I want to get, you know, I want to buy myself a Maserati. Or, you know, there's only, terrible investment. Right. I wouldn't call that an investment, but it's no, okay. You can finance terrible. It purchase, you know, there, there are definitely, you know, you can use it to purchase cars or whatever. So that's not a problem. But your limit is going to be whatever amount you have in your cash value account, right? That's going to be the max. And of course, I would never advise anyone to take out, well, you can't really take out 100% of what you have in your cash value. But I try to tell people not to take out more than 80% of what you have in there. It's always want to have some something in there, but you can take up to, you know, I would say up to 80% of what you have in your cash value account. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that the reason that the policy can work this way is because we structure it with what's called paid up additions. It's a type of rider that you add to the policy. And it's really that paid up addition that allows you to store more money into the policy. So you may initially buy the policy, let's say it's a million dollar policy. But over time, each year when you're putting more money in, the death benefit is also growing. So in most cases, what you'll see is maybe in year one, the you know policy with a million dollar face value. But by the time you know you hit age, you know sixty or eighty or something like that, it you know could be up to three million, and your cash value is growing at the same rate, right? So that cash value account is growing, and it's also increasing your death benefit. So if you took someone let's say somebody 30 years old and they understood this and decided instead of doing the, I think this year it's 19,500 in a 401k, Mm -hmm. I'm going to invest in this because with a 401k um, you also some, you can borrow against Uh, again, it's a limited amount. You have to pay it back. Um, You pay yourself with interest. Um, But other than that small borrowing amount, Uh, because it's a small percentage of whatever you have, you don't really have access to it at all until you retire, hit whatever age it is. Right. So can you walk us through a scenario of what that would look like for somebody? Let's say they only had that 20, what's called $20,000 a year. You know, at what point can they start pulling out? And is there a specific percentage? Right. So there's no time limit, right? I mean, once it's your money, right? So I always obviously recommend people to kind of let it build up for a few years. So 
Um, your insurance policy initially is going to have, you know, there's going to be some fees that come out up front. So it's going to be commissions. It's going to be the cost of insurance. I mean, there are some costs up front, right? Mm -hmm. So in that first year, if you're, let's just say you're putting in 20,000, if you put in $20,000 in premiums that first year, you're not going to have 20,000 in your cash value account. It might be closer to like 11 or 12,000 or something like that. In year two, you're putting another 20. And again, there's still going to be some costs. So it's really in like year four or five where you're going to start to see, you know, more money there. So you do need to allow some time for the, the policy to build up initially. Okay. But after that, that's when like all the costs are already factored in. So when I talked about sort of ongoing costs, that's why that's the, one of the advantages of the whole life policy, because you don't have that kind of eating away or eroding as you go. But once you have, even in that first year, even if you had just say the $11,000, if you wanted to take out, you know, 8,000, you could, or not take out, but okay. if you wanted to borrow up to 8,000, you could do that. It's, it's up to you because it's your money. So that's it's good. really up to you to decide what is the amount that you want. If you're trying to, you're waiting to build up to a certain number then it just would depend on how you're funding it to see how many years it would take to get up to that point to when you have that money um, mm -hmm. accessible. So that is one of the things that people say like, oh, but I put my money away and then I got to wait. And so, yes, it's true. You, you know, you do have to wait. But when you talk about the scenario, like you just mentioned with the 401k plan, it's a, it's a similar thing. Yeah. Um, you're putting the money in there. Um, but the thing that people have to keep in mind with any type of tax deferred so whether it's traditional IRA, 401k, you have to keep in mind that by deferring paying taxes today, you're actually paying more taxes tomorrow. And that's why the IRS loves those, <laughs> those accounts, right? So here's an example, uh, just to use round numbers. Okay, let's use 10,000. So let's just say that someone was contributing $10,000 a year into their 401k plan, into the pre-tax amount, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they start doing that, you know, at age 25. So they do that for 40 years and they've been contributing $10,000. Now, of course, that's going to grow. You know, the market's going to go up and down in that time, but it's going to grow. And I don't know, let's just say that that 10,000, let's say that 10,000 has grown to be 30,000. Okay. Just as a round number. So you could have paid taxes on $10,000 today or you'll end up paying taxes on $30,000 later. Right. Right. So you now, had you, paid the ten, have you, had you paid the taxes on the 10,000 today, and maybe you had, let's just say you had 7,000 after taxes, and you put that money into a policy and let that money grow and compound over time. Now you have a pool of money that's sitting there that you can then leverage for investments or you know things later. So yes, your 401k plans grow, but they, number one, get eroded by fees. And they, number two, have a huge tax bill at the end, which most people don't really think about. What you end up having in the end is a fraction of what you may have thought you were going to have because of right. all the taxes and fees that have been coming out over time or at the end. Right. And I use the 401k. I talk about it in, in an episode to reduce my adjusted gross income because it helped right. with regard to scholarships, et cetera. But that right. phase of my life is over. So I don't need to do yeah. that anymore. You just brought up a great point. So whole life policies are shielded from that. So if you have your money put away into a whole life policy, that is not factored in when your children are applying for financial aid. Oh, the whole life policy is a private contract. It is not in the purview of the IRS. It is not something you have to disclose. Like you'll never pay or never have to file a 1099. You know, it's really a private contract between you and the insurance company. And any money that you have in there is your private property. When you I'm have in 401ks or what are called qualified accounts, qualified meaning the IRS has qualified it. They said, yep. We are more than happy to allow you to put your money in this type of account for these benefits. And it's because we want to recognize the benefits today, right? We're, we're a society who likes to have benefits today and not thinking about what could happen later. So right. a lot of us, you know, I mean, I had, you know, we've all done it, put money into 401k plans, right? So we are encouraged to do so because we're thinking of, ooh, we can, you know, for, just like you mentioned, for your purposes, it was really to help with your children qualifying for scholarships and that, or financial aid. But for most of us, we've just been taught that that's the best way to save for retirement is to put money away into a 401k. Yeah. And 
again, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's not, uh, you know, it, it, it costs you more than you realize. Yeah. There's other ways to grow your money for the long term or for the retirement time of your life. It was actually part of the reason I quit a job that I had was because the only way I could get access to that 401k was to quit it so that yeah. I, could, I could move it to another vehicle sure. that yeah. I could use. So why do they call this infinite banking? So infinite banking, so the process of, so the first step is getting the policy and building up the cash value. The infinite banking strategy is where you're leveraging the cash value to make, you know, those investments or purchases, whatever it is. And the reason that they call it infinite is because you basically are, let's, let's say I've, I've built up a cash value account of, let's say $50,000 and I want to get my, maybe not my Maserati for 50,000, but you know, I want to get a car. <laughs> So I say, okay, I'm going to, instead of getting a loan at the bank or financing through the car company, I'm going to borrow it from my policy. One of the companies I use now, their rate is 4.4%. Maybe that's not a great rate for a car today, but if that was, let, let's say that it was, um, you know, I don't know. Well, let's just stick with the car example, but the rate is 4.4%. So I could borrow 30,000 from my policy and use that basically pay cash at the dealership and use that. And I'm basically paying myself back. Now the rate that I've been charged by the insurance company is 4.4, but it's very reasonable that I might be charged five or 6% at a dealership. So I would pay myself back that rate. Yes. The 4.4% of it is still going back to the insurance company because you know, you're paying them the interest, but that difference is what you're saving. Mm -hmm. So a bigger or better example where, especially with business owners, people who say like, I have a dentist client and she wants to expand her office. She wants to buy equipment. When you get equipment, it's usually leased. And if you've ever leased anything, <laughs> you know that the rates are very high. They're literally in the twenties. So she can borrow 50,000 from her cash value at 4.4% and buy the equipment, but she pays herself back the same rate that she would have paid for the lease, which is like 24% or something like that. So she's actually able to stuff away or store away more cash into that policy because she's paying herself back the amount that it would be, you know, if she was paying the market, let's just say. Yeah. So yeah. infinite means that you're just continually going back to borrow against your own policy instead of going external. And so every time you do that, your cash value is growing because you're never withdrawing it. So if you think about your 401k example, even when you have access to it, so let's just say you had $100,000 in there and you borrowed 30,000 against it. Well, your balance actually dropped to 70,000 and then you had to use after-tax dollars to put money back in, right? So it took however many years for you to pay back that 30,000, but in that time, your, your money was only growing on the 70, right? And then the 70 started to go up. What's different is in your cash value account, it stays at 100. Now you may have borrowed 30,000, but the value of your account is staying at 100. So that compounding wow. interest each year is on the 100. When you put in the next year's premium, it's now, let's say, you know, 120,000, it's growing on the 120. Even if you took out another loan for another 30,000, it's the 120 that's continuing to grow and compound. You're not withdrawing the money, you're just borrowing against it. So it's wow. infinitely growing. And you're infinitely able to borrow, basically leverage it, leverage those dollars for other things. So you can use it for a car, right? But you can also use it for investments. Right. Use right. it for things that are going to be, you know, revenue generating for you, cash flowing for you. And so with the example of the dentist, mm -hmm. when you say it was her choice, so she borrowed $50,000 to buy this equipment, pays herself back at 4.4%. But like she made the choice to actually contribute another 20% because that's what she would have been paying to lease the instruments in the first place. Exactly. So okay. you think of it as we're financing everything every day anyway, right? Whether it's our cars, it's equipment. So are you going to pay the finance company 24% or pay yourself 24%? Yeah. Right? So of the 24, again, the 4.4 goes to the insurance company for the loan, right? The interest on the loan. But the rest of that, she's putting into her own policy. Right. Right. So you're paying yourself what you would have paid others. So your pot continues to just grow and grow and grow. Okay. Right? Yeah. Your principal is safe, plus your, you know, what you've earned is safe and it's all growing 
you know, basically tax free. <laughs> right. That is amazing. It's very exciting. So how can, yeah. uh, I know that we're going to have some assets that we'll put in the show notes, but how can someone get started in this? Like what, what do they need to do? Step one, what do they need to do? So step one is they can reach out to me if they'd like, but you want to reach out to someone who is, you know, experienced in infinite banking because you obviously you need to use a licensed life insurance agent. I guess that's the first step. <laughs> I know that there's a lot of websites that say, Hey, just, you know, get a quote and get it, you know, buy it online. And you can do that if you would like, but you're not going to learn any of the strategies and you can't really set it up the right way. Um, but I would encourage you to reach out to a licensed agent like myself or someone else. You want to find someone who is experienced in infinite banking, knows how to set these up because again, you know, you have to know how to set it up properly and design a policy that works for the client. But that's really the first step is reach out to someone, you know, ask your questions, right? Help them. So like for me, I would, I would like to understand what are your objectives? Are you someone who's just trying to transfer money into like a more tax efficient vehicle? Or are you just, you know, graduating from school and you're just trying to start to build up your savings? Like, what is your objective? What are you trying to do? And we would set something up. How much money do you have available to put in? Then you have an application process. So you have to just complete an application. We do everything online. My whole practice is virtual. So just like you and I are talking online, this is how I work with my clients. I'm licensed in several states. So, you know, I can help you. So that's basically it, right? So reach out to someone who is a licensed insurance agent for your state, who is also uh, understands the, you know, infinite banking Yep. And you would meet with them, you would set up, uh, complete the application, and then, you know, it would just go from there. And I would say just from my own experience, you know, my advice is always, I'm sure there are a lot of insurance agents out there who don't understand this at all. So very, very, <laughs> very specifically ask about this. And my approach to investing at all is I want to talk with people who've done it themselves. I want to see yeah. their skin in the game and uh, be willing to share with me very honestly, kind of, yeah, okay, exactly how did you use this? Exactly how did it grow? Um, Because it's amazing what most people in these positions, financial advisors and other, they're just selling you whatever product is going to make them the most money, which I I was in sales for 25 years. It makes sense. Yes. Yeah. You know, when I'm making investments, I want to speak with someone who's done it themselves, has possibly lost money or made money or sees the benefits over it. So I think those are good yeah. questions. Yeah, I think you brought up a great point. Like I'm an independent licensed agent. I don't, you know, I'm not what we call, you know, captive. So captive means you work for one particular company. I'm not captive. I work independently. I So I have access to a few different companies. I only use mutual life insurance companies. I think that's another important point I'd like to make. There are mutual life insurance companies and then stockholder life insurance companies. Hmm. So mutual life insurance companies, the main difference is that the policyholders basically own that company and stockholder companies, the, basically the shareholders, <laughs> you know, they get a lot of skin in the game. So when it comes to dividends that are paid each year, and of course, dividends are not guaranteed, just like Apple can't guarantee that they will pay dividends, but the mutual life insurance companies that I use have paid dividends for over hundred years consistently. But when those dividends are paid, they're all paid to the policyholders in a mutual life insurance company. In a stockholder company, Just like any stock shareholding company, there's going to be, you know, dividends paid to the shareholders before they're paid to the policyholders. So that's a very important distinction because obviously that too, it's affecting your ability to grow your wealth, right? You're not going to get as many dividends as you would in a mutual life insurance company. The other point I wanted to make is I heard you say investments. So I want to be clear that a whole life insurance policy is not an investment, it is really more comparable to a savings account, right? So I think of it as your place to put your capital to build up your savings, and then you leverage that money for your investments. Now, there is a type of insurance policy called universal life, and that could be a whole other show. And I, I do not sell universal life. I don't encourage people to get it. I only sell the plain Jane whole life insurance policies Um, But I also sell term. And I think that's another point I wanted to make is like, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with term life insurance. There's definitely a a purpose for it. 
but it's not a wealth building tool. The whole life insurance is really a wealth building tool. Universal life insurance. The main reason that I don't like it is just because it has additional costs and it has additional risk. And Mm -hmm. my, you know, my philosophy is your insurance should be just that it should be the most secure asset that you hold Mm -hmm. and be the safest and the most liquid. And that's what life insurance is. A universal life insurance policy over time, the costs are going to increase, which means your savings is going to increase. And why would I sell a client that product? Right. <laughs> right? I'm, right. I'm telling you, I'm teaching you about looking and being aware of your costs and things that will erode your wealth. So I'm not going to sell you or encourage you to buy a product that's going to eventually do that. Right. Plain Jane whole life policies that are high cash value dividend paying and term insurance. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. If you look at it as a savings account that has a much higher interest return, you know, you have access to it. And the only thing you don't have access to, it sounds like, are the first year kind of fees, et cetera. But looking on a spreadsheet over a long period of time, I'm sure we can see how that that weighs out against others. So that's very helpful. I mean, we can't go into it in great detail, obviously. (laughs) This, This is why you're have this business. So we will include all of your information at the end. But before we do, I wanted to ask you a few questions off this topic, but just about you. Would you share with us what you consider to be your biggest financial mistake? Oh. <laughs> I've made many. I mean, I, I've oh, made many in my lifetime. Who hasn't, right? Um, but I would say the wound that hurts the most <laughs> was uh, several years ago, I had a business partner. We did not have enough, like I've learned this now, right? Didn't have enough things in writing. I was really more the financial partner. He was like the doer. I was, you know, working. I mean, in the end, long story short, he, you know, ran off with my money. Um, mm-hmm. It was over $100,000. and very Well, over 100,000. Oh my gosh. But still, right? 100,000. It was a lot of money over the course of, I would say, maybe like five years. You know, I have no idea where he is. I I mean, obviously, you know, you can't hold that resentment forever. So I mean, it's been several years that that happened. But yeah, the biggest lesson is sign, you know, dot every I and cross every T. If you're going to, you know, start a business partnership or any type of partnership, make sure that you have documentation, make sure both parties have signed. Maybe there's a witness, <laughs> right. you know, cover your butt. It was a very yeah. expensive mistake in my naive youth, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> those numbers, I really appreciate you sharing that because for a lot of years, the reason I started this podcast and want to share I spent many years and I didn't tell anybody any of the things I went through. I was so embarrassed. I was so ashamed. You know, I don't know what my biggest financial mistake is. I've done many and they are to the tune of 70,000 and 85,000. I mean, these are not small mistakes that were made, but the best recovery from it was to pivot and to move on versus either stay in resentment or try to really strangle that problem until it spurt it out an answer, just keep moving on yeah. and keep building and learning. And you'll find it's almost like getting a, you know, I, I, maybe I just justify this, but it's how I got my degree in what I'm doing now I was not going back to school. It was, it was paying the hard dues. It was it the school of hard knocks, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What do you think has had the largest impact on your personal quest for five for financial independence? I think it's, you know, kind of, you just touched on it is mindset, right? You, you can sit and sulk and dwell on financial mistakes that you've made or be like, oh my gosh, it's going to take forever to, you know, save or get to this magic number that you have in your mind. Or you can dig in, learn, soak up as much knowledge as you can and take action. I mean, I feel like the one thing that holds people back is some people will read and read and listen and study and they will never do anything. Like you have to just start and take action. I can't express that, you know, enough. You've got to be bold. You need to build up some confidence in yourself, right? You need to have a mindset that says, I deserve 
to have money. I deserve to have freedom, which is what money can really offer you. I deserve to have these choices. So what can I do? How do I participate in this? Am I waiting for someone to dictate to me what my salary is going to be or what I'm going to get a bonus or what I'm going to get a pay increase? Or am I going to start to do other things to make sure that I have control over income that I'm bringing in? Mm-hmm. Because that job can be lost in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. You have other sources of income coming in. How do you take control of your finances? Right. That's great. Um, we are going to share at the end of this, uh, you have provided us, it's the 25 benefits of whole life, infinite banking. We're going to provide that in the link in the show notes. I also wanted to mention, and I know it's just one of your marketing vehicles, but you have a podcast called Rebel Rock Wealth Talk, right? Rebel Rock Money Talk. Money Talk. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Rebel, and I really enjoy it. So I encourage everybody to subscribe to it, but you know, those of us seeking this independence and don't really want to punch a clock for the rest of our lives and don't want to be dependent on somebody else about what's going to happen with this hard earned cash. You cover things like mindset and because it really is. People ask me all the time, why would you do any of this? Why wouldn't you just invest in the stock market? And I think, well, because why would I, I'm, I'm handing over the control. Yeah, I have a portion of what I do in the stock market, but yeah you know, I've kind of lost faith. I think I can do pretty well on my own. But other than those things, where can people find you, learn more? I know you will offer a free consultation. So where can we find you? Sure. You could just go to rebelrockwealth.com and you, there's, you can look around there. There's some information. Um, you can just click the link to schedule a free discovery call. If you just have questions, I'm more than happy to answer those for you. I'm on Instagram, <laughs> uh, Rebel Rock Money Talk. But yeah, if you also just wanted to go peek at the podcast, I only have a few episodes in, but I'm continuing to grow. So, Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you would subscribe and review this podcast, it would mean the world to me. It truly is the only way for me to know how I'm doing and what you hear and what you'd like to see in the future. If you want to reach me, you can at a lot of places. My website is www.micro-empires.com. You can email me at jennifer at micro-empires.com. You can call or text 213-973-7206. And of course, you can reach me on social media, on Facebook under my name or Micro Empires. I have a page in a community. You can find me at Twitter and Instagram under my name and of course on LinkedIn. Thanks again, everybody. See you next time.